My name is Wallace Sutherland. I'm the Associate Vice President of Student Affairs. I am also the co-chair of the 1619 to 2019 400 years, years of Resilience series. My co-chair is Professor April Logan. In the back, everyone, please give uh, April a round of applause for her service. I really do want to express my appreciation to you for, for coming out to university faculty, staff, and, and students. I want to give a special acknowledgement to our university president, Dr. White. So please stand so we can recognize you. And Victoria Rasmussen, Dr. White's wife, thank you very much for coming out and being with us as well. Before Dr. Logan comes on to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, I just want to take a couple of minutes to just try to sum up this culminating event. This is the final event of our series. Who knows what the future holds? But right now, this is our final event. This is the 10th event of the semester, the 10th event of the semester. Now looking back, it's like, wow, we did all of this in a, in a semester? This concept started, I would say, back in the middle of spring 2019. So between April 2019 and August 2019, we put together 10 very ambitious events that involve students, faculty, staff, and administrators. And I think we did a great job at Salisbury <laughs> University. And I do believe that Salisbury University is probably the only university in the state of Maryland that has offered such a diverse <coughs> and comprehensive series of events. And I think that's something for us to be proud of, given where our society is today. So about 400 years ago, this past August 2019, a ship with carrying 20 and odd Negroes arrived in Port Comfort, Virginia, which is now known as the Hampton area. And that really began our horrible history in terms of the institutionalization of slavery. And during the course of that time, we have seen the ugly effects of slavery. And those effects include intense, heavy, ongoing incarceration of African Americans, particularly African American men, after the slave period. We see the ongoing discrimination in our school systems. We see institutional, uh, institutional racism in many of our, our workplaces. So we have a lot of work to do. And even as we stand in our truth here at Salisbury University, it is certainly to some extent a moment of sadness where we have to deal with some individual writing some very awful racist and sexist words on one of our academic buildings. But we should not rest in that sadness. We should be inspired by that and recognize the hope and the opportunity. This kind of event is an opportunity for us all to come together as a community to stand in our truth and confront all that brings us together, including to confront the hate that divides us. But let's not stay in that hate. Let's move intentionally toward reconciliation, healing, and ultimately forgiveness. So thank you very much for a semester of support. And if there are any members here today who are on the planning committee, please stand so we can recognize you. Any committee members who are here. I saw Dr. Small. Thank you to the committee. And I just want to read to you the list of sponsors that helped make this event as well as the entire series possible. Beacon, the College of Health and Human Services, the English Department, Administration and Finance Office, Fulton School of Liberal Arts, Henson School of Technology, History Department, Honors College, Institutional Equity and Inclusion, NAB Center, Purdue School of Business, President's Office, Provost Office, School of Social Work, Seagull Century, Seidel School of Education, Social Justice, Equity and Teaching Transformation Faculty Learning Community, Student Activity Fee, 
Student Affairs Division, and SU Libraries. Let's give them all a round of applause. And now, without further ado, I'll bring on my co-chair, Dr. Logan, to introduce our distinguished speaker for the evening. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of this event. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. I also want to recognize that this lecture is a part of the Department of English as uh, um, Ron Dodderer Public Lecture Series, and so we're very um, happy to be able to offer this, and again, just want to thank the English Department for its support of this program. Um, as well as said, I'm Dr. April Logan in the Department of English, and I'm very excited to see all of you here this evening, and I'm very um, happy to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. John Ernest. Um, Dr. John Ernest is one of the world's top scholars on 19th century African American literature, and he also focuses on racial history and racial theory. Dr. Ernest is a Judge Hugh H. Ju sorry, Judge Hugh M. Morris Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English at the University of Delaware. Before arriving at the University of Delaware, he was the Eberly Family Distinguished Professor of American Literature at West Virginia University for seven years, and he taught for 12 years at the University of New Hampshire, where he served as Director of Undergraduate Composition, Co-Director of the Discovery Program, and Director of African American Studies. At UNH, he received the Outstanding Assistant Professor Award in 1997, the UNH Diversity Support Coalition's Positive Change Award, and the Jean Brearley Award for Excellence in Teaching from 2003 to 2004, and the New Hampshire Excellence in Education Award for Higher Education. So um, we're, you know, SU is known as a teaching institution, so I think you'll see from Dr. Ernest tonight that he's a wonderful scholar, but also a wonderful um, educator and teacher as well. <coughs> Um, if my memory serves me correctly, I first became acquainted with John in 2009 at the annual Modern Language Association Conference when I approached him with a question about a paper he presented on at on the panel, and I only hoped that he would be friendly. I was just a graduate student, and so I wasn't sure how that would go over. Um, in that brief conversation, I was struck immediately by his patience and attentiveness. In addition, he said that he would be willing to continue our discussion after the conference via email and even possibly look at some drafts of my dissertation. So obviously I was about to faint um, <laughs> from, uh, to think that a major scholar would be interested in reading you know, sort of my, my scratchings. Um, as a graduate student and even now a tenured professor, I found that, I've found that while many advanced scholars might express a willingness to provide advice to students or junior scholars beyond their campuses, few actually follow through on their intentions. Yet John and all of my dealings with him has been reliable, insightful, and generous with his time and knowledge. Although he might not have the same expectations for service or informal mentoring placed on him that we sometimes talk about as far as minority uh, scholars um, due to their race or gen gender, anyone looking at his CV can see that he certainly always has a number of professional commitments on his plate. Everything from organizing seminars, founding and supervising uh, book series, writing books, and chairing dissertations. Yet he still makes time for encouraging and advising the next generation of 18th and 19th century African American literature scholars, whatever their socioeconomic background. I became familiar with his work before we met while conducting research for, um, for a seminar paper. In particular, the first publication I read by him was Economies of Identity, Harriet E. Wilson's Our Nig and 19th Century Literary Criticism. As I read this article, I was struck by um, Ernest's ability to draw on the growing body of scholarship on African American history to advance his own original approach to Iron Egg as an autobiographical novel that raises questions about race and capitalism as American institutions. Over the years, I have come to recognize that this article is a signature John Ernest text. Impeccably researched and cogently articulated arguments that signal exciting new directions for scholarship. Today, partially due to John's example, I aspire to have the same thoroughness, accessibility, and courage in my writing and my teaching. John is an extraordinary scholar. He's the author or editor of 12 books and over 40 journal articles and book chapters. His recent books include Liberation Historiography, African American Writers and the Challenge of History, 1794 to 1861, Chaotic Justice, Rethinking African American Literary History, A Nation Within a Nation, Organizing African American Communities Before the Civil War, Douglas in His Own Time, A Biographical Chronicle of His Life, 
uh, and the Oxford Handbook of the African American Slave Narrative is one of the reasons we've invited him here this evening, which it came out in 2014. Um, recent editions include Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown, written by himself. Um, McHenry uh, also uh, Jones's Hearts of Gold, which he co-edited with um, Eric Gardner, and William Wells Brown's My Southern Home or the South and Its People. His current book project, and I wish I could say which one is my favorite, but um, they're all really uh, fascinating. And, and more so, I just want to point out that even in the sort of the scholarly editions of the known works, there's, you know, even just the introductions are just so rich with, um, you know, fascinating insights, uh, uh, further leads for research. And so, again, I can't stress enough um, how wonderful it is to be able to study his work. Um, his most recent, what he's working on right now is called Reading While White, the 19th Century Roots of White Racism. Um, and he and Joyce and K. Moody are general editors of Regenerations, African American Literature and Culture, a series published by West Virginia University Press devoted to reprinting good editions and undervalued works by early African American writers. And I definitely want to give him much credit for sort of pushing us to think beyond our sort of typical ways of thinking about um, African American literature um, tradition. Um, and just to say a little bit more about the Oxford Handbook of African American Slave Narrative, um, it approaches the history of slave testimony in three ways, by prioritizing the broad tradition over individual authors, by representing interdisciplinary approaches to slave narratives, by highlighting emerging scholarship on slave narratives concerning both established debates over the concerns of authorship and agency, um, and for developing concerns like eco-critical readings of slave narratives. Ultimately, the aim of the book is not to highlight the singularity of any particular account, nor to comfortably locate slave narratives in traditional literary and cultural history, but rather to faithfully represent a body of writing and testimony that was designed to speak for many, to represent unspeakable, the unspeakable, and to account for the experience of enslaved and nominally free uh, communities. I think I can speak for myself and my students who love studying the slave narrative, and so I think we're in for a real treat tonight. In addition to the scholarship, uh, Dr. Ernest's professional service has also provided an important example for me. In addition to his model mentoring, his service reflects a keen awareness of the important role academics can play in society beyond educating others in traditional classrooms. He knows that such uh, sometimes uncompensated projects, public talks, and serving on a steering committee for online archival projects, for example, affect change in institutions and the communities around them. Although John understands that such efforts can be difficult due to the prejudices of others and the material conditions of institutions and one's life, he pursues them anyway. After our first meeting, he invited me to attend the Lord's Battle, I Mean to Fight the Politics of African American Piety, a West Virginia University seminar in literary and cultural studies that proved pivotal in teaching me about the context and thus better understanding the religious writings of African American women writers um, such as Joanna Lee. Therefore, I am deeply honored to present Dr. John Ernst, just in case you couldn't tell, yes, he's one of my mentors, <laughs> to you this evening due to his service to the profession, scholarship, teaching excellence, and dedication to the public humanities. So without further delay, I invite um, John to come up and give his talk. Good evening. Good evening. How are y'all doing? Good, good. Well, I have to tell you, I'm truly honored to be here at Salisbury University. I'm grateful to April and to Wallace Sutherland for including me in this really extraordinary series of events to observe 400 years of resilience. And I'm grateful to all of you for coming out tonight and for coming to the other events in this series and for your recognition of the importance of reflecting on the inception and effects of slavery in America. This is a subject that has occupied me throughout my career and I hope to share with you today at least something of what I've learned along the way. I'm going to talk about a form of writing and of testimony that this history has produced, slave narratives, and I would like us to reflect on the stories we know, the stories we think we know, and the stories we should know. Stories are important. The world runs on stories. I'll guarantee that you can't think of a relationship, a family, a community, 
or a nation without thinking of a story central to its existence, whether positive or negative, encouraging or crippling. Think about it. Even one week after you meet someone who might prove to be important to you, you already start telling a shared story about the common interests or coincidences or simply the events that brought you together. Families take vacations during which they tell the stories about the other vacations they've taken. <laughs> Communities hold festivals designed to identify and promote their story. Nations come with their own mythologies and these stories, whether rags to riches, American dreams, or some other way of identifying what it means to be a citizen of that nation, those stories define our dreams and inspire us to chart our course through life. But when they lack a sustaining or credible story, relationships also sometimes end. Families often struggle. Communities fall apart and nations find themselves entering into difficult territory as if experiencing a great identity crisis from which they might not recover. Stories are important. And because the system of slavery was probably the most influential but most misunderstood aspect of American history, how we tell the story of slavery in America is especially important. This is a story that will define not only who we are, but also who we can hope to become collectively as a community. If we get it right, if we approach our future, if we get it right, we can approach our future with the kind of hope we like to associate with our country. If we get it wrong, then we will continue down a destructive path that has led to much of what we are experiencing today. But this is also a difficult story to tell. Let me take you back to an evening, a little over 150 years ago, when someone tried to testify to the realities of the system of slavery in America. The man was William Wells Brown, and he was born in slavery near Lexington, Kentucky, the son of an enslaved black woman and a slave-holding white man, and indeed he was probably related to his owner. He escaped from slavery in 1834, and eventually would become one of the leading abolitionists of his time, a recognized and respected lecturer, and in my opinion, one of the great writers of the 19th century. On November 14, 1847, Brown delivered a lecture to the Female Anti-Slavery Society of Salem, Massachusetts, in which he announced that his subject would be American slavery as it is, including its influence on American character and morals. What strikes me about this talk is that Brown begins by saying, slavery never has been represented and slavery never can be represented. For Brown, the realities of slavery were almost impossible to relate. And yet the, rela the realities were such that he was compelled to try to relate them. To really try to do, those, do so though, he would need, he said, to whisper it to his audience one at a time because the realities of enslavement were so intimately haunting that one could barely give voice to them in front of a crowd. Brown then went on to represent slavery in a masterful performance that included definitions of slavery, examples of its intimate violations, commentary on the white press and the commercial relations interests involved, remarks on the legal system required by slavery, and observations on the extent to which slavery corrupted white American character and undermined the political and religious ideals to which white Americans claimed devotion. It was a system, Brown argued, at once so extensive and so intimate as to both resist and require representation. And it was a system that touched every aspect of American life. For Brown, slavery was the economic, political, and social system that provided the underlying but unspeakable unity to a nation all but lost in its own mythology and its own degradation. In this address, and indeed in his very existence, Brown represented a nation that regularly proclaimed its devotion to liberty, even though every aspect of the nation, political, economic, social, legal, even theological, was shaped by and devoted to the system of slavery. 
This was a nation that regularly celebrated a founding document proclaiming that all men are created equal, even as it was devoted to unjust, enslaving, and even murderous social distinctions. This was a nation whose champion of liberty, New Hampshire's Daniel Webster, helped to craft a political compromise in 1850 that not only protected slavery, but also violated the rights and endangered the security of African Americans in the North, those who had at least nominal freedom, and who all had worked to create successful and sustaining communities against all odds. This was a nation whose highest legal authorities, the Supreme Court, declared in 1857 that black Americans had no rights that white men were bound to respect. This was a nation almost obsessed with defining and controlling the terms of black identity. The impact of slavery was felt in every corner of American life. And in the century and a half since slavery was legally ended, the lingering effects of slavery still remain strong. Try to imagine American history without slavery. It simply isn't possible. No matter where you look, be it the history of the labor movement or the history of entertainment, you will soon encounter clear evidence of the forceful effects of slavery or of the racial attitudes and distinctions that slavery both required and encouraged. This is not the story of slavery that you will encounter in most American textbooks, even today. In most cases, you'll find slavery safely relegated to a discrete chapter, maybe even a portion of a chapter, a difficult episode in American history, but one finally resolved by the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, and the 13th Amendment. But the full history of slavery is not one that can be brought to a neat conclusion, particularly since prominent among the effects of history have been a studied avoidance of the subject in American society and the miseducation of both white and black Americans on their shared history. In Brown's time, those African Americans fortunate enough to live in nominal freedom faced lives shaped by persistent and crippling racism what Hosiah Easton, one of Brown's contemporaries, called slavery in disguise. This slavery in disguise was just as pernicious in his way as was legal bondage, restricting African-American opportunity to the extent that it limited the growth and threatened the vitality of African-American communities struggling to establish themselves in a racist environment. Indeed, while African-American leaders in the North recognized that to maintain a stable community, you need strong stories, they also understood how difficult it was to tell their own stories when white Americans controlled most of the press. In 1827, an editorial from the first edition of the first African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, announced the central mission of the newspaper, which was to be the voice of the community and to thereby exercise some influence in the representation of African-American character. We wish to plead our own cause, the editorial stated. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us dearly. In 1853, African-Americans amplified this sense of mission at that year's Colored National Convention, which was held in Rochester, New York in July of that year. In a publication issued from the convention, they asked, what stone has been left unturned to degrade us? What hand has refused to fan the flame of prejudice against us? What American artist has not caricatured us? What wit has not laughed at us in our wretchedness? What songster has not made merry over our depressed spirits? What press has not ridiculed and contemned us? What pulpit has withheld from our devoted heads its angry lightning or its sanctimonious hate? In 1859, publisher and editor Thomas Hamilton continued this cause in his opening apology for the Anglo-African magazine emphasizing the, the systemic nature of these white misrepresentations of black character. The wealth, the intellect, the legislation, state and federal, the pulpit, the science of America, Hamilton asserted, have concentrated on no one point so heartily as in the endeavor 
to write down the Negro as something less than a man. Small wonder then that William Wells Brown believed that slavery never had and never would be represented. Even if one could do justice to the subject, one would still have to break through the imposing walls of prejudice and racial control before one could even hope for a proper hearing. But that is exactly what many African Americans who experienced slavery firsthand tried to do. And their efforts to tell their stories, to represent the unrepresentable, are collectively known as slave narratives. In a study that was essential, in fact foundational, in inspiring and guiding serious scholarly interest in slave narratives, Marion Wilson Starling provided in 1946 a bibliographic guide to the location of 6,006 narrative records, records that extend from 1703 to 1944. These records, Starling notes, are to be discovered, to be discovered in judicial records, broadsides, private printings, abolitionist newspapers and volumes, scholarly journals, church records, unpublished collections, and a few regular publications. Included among these narratives are, book, are the book-length autobiographies and biogra biographies that have been celebrated for their historical importance. Uh, some of the best known of these book-length narratives include, for example, Frederick Douglass's 1845 Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, or Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery, published in 1901, books by women such as Harriet Jacob's 1861 narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, or Lucy A. Delaney's From the Darkness Cometh the Light, or Struggles for Freedom, published in 1891, have also gradually been recognized as essential entrances to the history of slavery, particularly since so many of the narratives we know best were written by men. So these are very important books. But beyond the books lies a very broad range of testimony including over 10,000 pages of interviews gathered by the Federal Writers Project in the 1930s under the auspices of the Works Progress Administration. The record of slave narratives, in other words, is extensive, varied, and rich. African Americans, it turned out, did much to address their exclusion from and misrepresentation in the historical record, and the white press could not forever suppress or distort their testimony. So why are we still struggling to come to a balanced and comprehensive understanding of the history of slavery, one that extends beyond a short chapter in a history textbook, a chapter seemingly designed to keep slavery, in effect, in its place? In part, the answer is that scholars were slow to appreciate the value of this rich record. For many years, Scholars dismissed the recorded testimony of the formerly enslaved as unreliable historical records to the extent that they considered such testimony at all. For many years, scholarship on slavery was undeniably racist, and histories of slavery were based almost entirely on the records kept by white slaveholders, on white journals and newspapers, and on other evidence that talked about the enslaved but could not possibly speak for those who were enslaved. With very few exceptions, it wasn't until the 1970s that most historians started to base their studies of slavery on the documents left behind by the enslaved themselves. Particularly important for our present purposes was John Blassingame's 1972 study, The Slave Community, Plantation Life in the American South in which Blassingame begins by noting, even a cursory examination of the literature shows that historians have never, have never systematically explored the life experiences of American slaves. This is in 1972. Whereas Southern planters, on the other hand, have had an extremely good press in the United States. Historians, he observed, have in effect been listening to only one side of a complicated debate. His concerns in this study, he emphasized, were dramatically different. And this is a quote. The book, this book describes and analyzes the life of the black slave, his African heritage, culture, family, acculturation, behavior, religion, and personality. 
As this list suggests, the range of questions to ask of slave testimony was broad, and eventually historians started to treat slave narratives as important information about the past. With new resources, though, came new complications. For slave testimony was anything but transparent, and those who wrote them were not always wholly free to tell their stories in their own way. And they were not always trusted when they did. Some readers questioned the authenticity of the slave narratives because they didn't believe that black Americans born in slavery were capable of writing their own life stories. Accordingly, Frederick Douglass, easily one of the most eloquent men of the 19th century, had to make the case for his own authorship in his first autobiography, which is titled, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, Written by Himself. Douglass's narrative includes a preface by two white writers testifying to his abilities, even though those abilities were abundantly clear throughout the narrative. And Douglass was not alone. A great number of slave narratives have some kind of documentation by white allies to attest to the ability of the author and the truth of the narrative. No matter how eloquent the writer, African Americans needed white authorization to tell the story as they saw it. But often the white presence goes even further. Autobiographical narratives and biographies of those who had been enslaved are often highly mediated, that is, presented to us by others. Since all of white culture was so deeply caught up in misrepresentations of black character and identity, the interest of even the most trusted white Americans in the life stories of black Americans was almost always a mixed blessing. Scholars and teachers still struggle to make the point, for example, that many of the speeches of Sojourner Truth, best known for asking, ain't I a woman, were later misremembered and misrepresented. Uh, Truth couldn't write, and the white writers who recorded her speeches not only put words in her mouth, but also presented Truth's speech patterns in stereotypical black southern dialect. If you've seen this in print, think about how it's presented. Stereotypical black southern dialect, even though Sojourner Truth was raised in a Dutch-speaking area of upstate New York. Where did she acquire a southern black dialect growing up speaking Dutch in upstate New York? Where does anybody in upstate New York end up sounding like somebody from the south? The evidence suggests that, in fact, the, it goes further. The evidence suggests, I hate to burst any bubbles here, that Sojourner Truth probably did not say, ain't I a woman? in her most famous speech. But the myth persists. The myth we know and care about more than the actual woman. In another case in which a prominent black woman has been misrepresented by her white admirers, the white writer Sarah Bradford, looking to help Harriet Tubman, wrote a biography that begins by having the young Tubman engaged with, and this is a quote, a group of merry little darkies. This is a biography of a prominent black activist that begins with this degrading characterization and then goes on to praise Tubman by distinguishing her and her family from other African Americans, asserting that, quote, all should not be judged by the idle, miserable darkies who have swarmed about Washington and other cities since the war, end quote. This is a friend. This is an ally writing for, for, for Tubman. And such well-intended but prejudiced misrepresentations were not at all unusual. Racism was rampant in the anti-slavery movement, and almost all African-American public figures of the time demonstrated a keen understanding of what it means to live in a white supremacist culture. African-American narrators, accordingly, were cautious about the prospect of revealing the details of their lives, even to benevolent white readers, were simultaneously being influenced by a culture bent on trivializing, eliminating, and otherwise controlling the African-American presence in the North. As, as many slave narratives realized, to tell your story is to give someone control over your life, unless they are willing to reveal just as much about themselves 
and many were not ready to give white Americans that kind of control. The most striking example of an African American life virtually lost in its story is that of Josiah Henson, who became associated with the white writer Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous fictional character, Uncle Tom. Following the publication of the original version of his story in 1849, and the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, Henson became famous, somewhat improbably, as the model for the character Uncle Tom in Stowe's novel. By the time the last version of Henson's story was published, his life had become so identified with that of Uncle Tom that any hope of understanding the actual man was lost in the fame of the fictional character. There is no evidence that Henson's first narrative provided Stowe with her model for the character Uncle Tom, but after Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, the association developed all the same, perhaps aided by Stowe's preface to the substantially revised version of Henson's life published in 1858. After that time, Henson's narrative was in the hands of the white English clergyman editor John Lobb, and the third version of his narrative published in 1877 was entitled Uncle Tom's Story of His Life, an autobiography of Reverend Josiah Henson, Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom from 1789 to 1876. In 1881, Lobb published the autobiograph autobiography of the Reverend Josiah Henson, Uncle Tom, from 1789 to 1881, and this is a version that includes chapters entitled Mrs. Stowe's Character, another entitled Uncle Tom, and the Editor's Visit to Her Majesty the Queen, another chapter titled Summary of Uncle Tom's Public Services, an appendix offering a sketch of Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe. Who was Josiah Henson? <laughs> By the time that the last of the books that promised to answer that question were published, we probably can't find the man beneath the myth. One could trace a similar path in the histories of many of those who tried to draw from their lives to either testify against slavery or to leave some sign of life, a community, and a world all but lost in the dominant version of history. Not everybody's true life story was lost to the fame of a fictional character or to political propaganda, which is what happened to Henson, but still many African Americans found their life stories strictly controlled by white editors and readers with particular expectations. Many scholars view Frederick Douglass's second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, as a declaration of independence from William Lloyd Garrison and the other white abolitionists who met, helped make possible his first autobiography published 10 years earlier. In 1849, the first narrative telling the story of Henry Box Brown was published. And this is an exciting story that told how Brown had placed himself in a shipping container and had himself shipped from Virginia to Philadelphia. The title of that narrative nearly tells the whole story that readers were interested in hearing. And this was, a, this was a narrative written by a white friend or ally. Narrative of Henry Box Brown, who escaped from slavery and closed in a box three feet long and two wide, written from a statement of facts made by himself with remarks upon the remedy for slavery. But that first narrative was written by the white abolitionist Charles Stearns, and if you read it, you'll wonder whether Brown had any voice in the narrative at all, since it all sounds very much like Stearns, and you have to read it to really get, get the feel for this. And it, um, Stearns even has this moment in the narrative where he has Brown say, and now I would like to introduce you to someone who knows much more about this subject than I do, and so he introduces Stearns, who's actually doing the writing. So Stearns has ventriloquized, you know, being a ventriloquist, putting his voice into Brown, having Brown introduce him so that he can enter the narrative and give a speech about slavery. And this is Brown's autobiography. In 1851, though, Brown tried to reclaim his story by publishing a second and much different narrative, narrative of the life of Henry Box Brown, written by himself, and he had much more to say than Stearns had allowed in the first version. <clears throat> In a different kind of self-reclamation, Thomas Jones resisted the kind of association that haunted Josiah Henson. Jones's original narrative, published in 1855, was entitled 
experience and personal narrative of Uncle Tom Jones, who was for 40 years a slave. Years later, Jones published another version, still written by another, but this one highlighting Jones's professional accomplishments and community and getting rid of the reference to Uncle Tom. It was called The Experience of, of Reverend Thomas H. Jones, who was a slave for 43 years, written by a friend as related to him by Brother Jones. To get at the truth of those who wrote slave narratives, to get at the truth, those who wrote slave narratives had to be strategic. One way to think of this is to say that they had a story to sell and they had a story to tell. One to get readers in the door and the other to tell readers the truth once they were there. There were the stories that white Americans were anxious to read, stories of hardship and struggle followed by the exciting tale of a heroic escape. But there were also stories that white Americans needed to hear, but were probably unprepared to accept. For example, the ways in which the system of slavery threatened the integrity of American principles and undermined Christianity, creating a hollow world where even the most fervent and hopeful language would no longer have any real meaning. That's not a story that white Americans looked for in slave narratives. But it is the story they will often find there. It was necessary, though, to draw readers in with a story they wanted to hear so as to give them, get them to listen to the stories they needed to hear. When William and Ellen Craft prepared to tell the story of their already famous 1848 escape from slavery, with Ellen disguised as a white gentleman and William disguised as her, or rather his, servant, they prepared to relate the story they had to sell the story people want to buy, for there was clearly an audience for this story. But the story they actually told included a number of strategic digressions, taking time to get to their famous story while making points about the systemic racism that made their escape both necessary and improbable. It's a great narrative. They say, and now we are about to tell you the story of how we escaped from slavery. But first, you know, this thing happened. Okay, um, excuse me for the digression. Now I'm going to get back to my story. But you know, actually this reminds me of something, and I'm just going to take a moment to tell you this. This is how the narrative proceeds. And those digressions tell what the readers probably were not looking to hear, but need to hear. Through these digressions, they address the story they needed to tell, the truth about the United States. And similarly, Henry Box Brown had a striking story to sell but when he revised Charles Stern's original 1849 narrative of his escape, he took the opportunity not only to foreground his own agency and voice, but also to reflect upon American culture more broadly. The point was to make slavery a threat not only to the enslaved and not only to slaveholders, but to any, American who, any Americans who value the stability of their ideals and institutions. You use the story people want to hear to get them to listen to the story they need to hear. Consider the most famous of the slave narratives, Frederick Douglass's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. In this narrative, Douglass is interested not only in telling his life story, but also in getting his white readers to think about their own stories. His main point is that cultures shape character and that Americans should worry about the effects the system of slavery was having on American Christianity. As Douglas narrates the story of his life, he narrates the process by which he was brought into the cultural system of slavery. When he passes through what he calls at the very beginning of the narrative, the blood-stained gate, the entrance to the hell of slavery, he enters a system designed to transform him into a slave. His point, in fact, is that the system works. It successfully enslaves people, making them what the system needs them to be. But it works only by keeping people within the gate, where they don't know how to question the terms of their own lives. This point becomes especially clear when Douglas talks about his experience with slave songs, those haunting songs that today we call the spirituals. Noting that these songs contain, and this is a quote, words which to many would seem unmeaning jargon, 
Douglas notes as well that the songs were actually quite profound and that truly understanding them would have an effect more powerful, and again a quote, than the reading of whole volumes of philosophy on the subject. But that power was lost to Douglas, he reports, when he was enslaved. I did not, when a slave, he confesses, understand the deep meaning of those rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle, so that I neither saw nor heard as those without might see and hear. That's the important distinction, being within the circle or seeing your life from outside that circle. This distinction is central to Douglas's, Douglas's entire narrative, in fact. Within the circle, the experience and training that shapes one's understanding render the words of slave songs incoherent, its melodies effective but inarticulate. Only outside the circle can one understand. The, the gates of slavery imprison selfhood and lock out morality, making the central question of the narrative, are you inside the circle of slavery or out? One of the most important points Douglas makes in this narrative, in fact, is that almost all Americans are inside the circle, locked, locked inside the gates of slavery, whether they are white or black, whether they live in the South or in the North. One expects this of the enslaved, but Douglas goes out of his way to show that white people can be caught in slavery's darkening gates as well. The central representative of the national system of slavery is the white overseer, Mr. Gore, who Douglas describes as, quote, a man possessing in an eminent degree all those traits of character indispensable to what is called a first-rate overseer. The central mediator between slaveholder and slave, the system's essential manager and enforcer, the overseer was the embodiment of the system of slavery, its institutional center. And Gore was the center of the center, the perfect candidate for this cultural office. Douglas says at one point, he was just the man for such a place, and it was just the place for such a man. This perfect correspondence of character and culture just the man for such a place, just the place for such a man. This perfect correspondence of character and culture serves as the warped ideal against which all other characters in the narrative are measured, the gravitational center towards which all others are drawn. We see other white characters transformed almost literally from angels to demons as they encounter the force of the system of slavery, drawn by a cultural force that leads ultimately to gore. Indeed, in a system seemingly based on deception and hypocrisy, Gore is the one who stands true to his codes of conduct, identity, and systemic order. He did nothing reluctantly, Douglas notes, no matter how disagreeable, always at his post, never inconsistent. Throughout the narrative, Gore stands as the ominously perfect cultural product, the ideal overseer who is defined by and defines in turn those other cultural roles, slaveholder, slave, upon which his identity depends. It is as if the system of slavery is designed to turn everyone into a version of Mr. Gore, which is exactly what we see happen throughout Douglas's narrative. So how do you break out? How do you learn to see from outside the circle? Douglas's answer is that we do that through education but it has to be an education based on an understanding of how the system works. Douglas's breakthrough comes when he begins learning his basic ABCs, when he begins to acquire basic literacy. But the real lesson comes when his owner worries about him acquiring literacy, worries about him learning too much, worries that learning to read would spoil Douglas for slavery. And he says something like that. When Douglas hears the owner express such concerns, he gets his second major lesson and his real breakthrough. These words, he writes, sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering, and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was the new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things from which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. 
he discovers that people enslave other people by controlling their education, controlling not just their bodies, but their minds. Armed with that breakthrough, Douglas boards this new train of thought and rides it down its interpretive track. The lesson he has learned is that he can't trust what white people around him say. He needs to learn how to read, but he also needs to learn how to read his world differently. And so Douglas embarks on, a, on this journey with a high hope and a fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn how to read. The new train of thought becomes, in fact, an interpretive method, a way of reading and negotiating the relationship between himself and his world. And like any good convert, he applies the lessons of this revelation to the task of reading his world with new eyes and fundamental assurance. Describing the way that he learned how to learn from the things his white owner said to him, Douglas describes this new mode of understanding, this way that he figured out concerning how to find the truth in a world of deception. And here's what he says. It gave me the best, and, and he's referring to, something, to, to his white, uh, white owner here, it gave, and, and that, what the white owner says, it gave me the best assurance that I might rely with the utmost confidence on the results which, as my owner said, would flow from teaching me to read. What he most dreaded, that I most desired. What he most loved, that I most hated. That which to him was a great evil to be carefully shunned was to me a great good to be diligently sought. sought. And the argument to which he so warmly urged against my learning to read only served to inspire me with a desire and determination to learn. Douglas found himself in a world of opposites, but understanding that helps him make sense of his life and to relocate himself, first to relocate himself mentally, and then eventually to relocate himself physically by escaping from slavery. But the lesson applies to the reader as well. This interpretive method provides Douglas with the key to understanding the US cultural system. And he makes a point of presenting this key to the reader in an appendix to the narrative. And it's an appendix that is just as important as the narrative itself. In his appendix, Douglas notes that he has spoken harshly about religion throughout the narrative. But he notes as well that he wants to make it clear that he was not being critical of Christianity itself, but only of the corrupted forms of Christianity he encountered when he was enslaved and even after he reached nominal freedom in the North. He draws a distinction between what he called the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, a distinction that follows from the lessons he learned under slavery. What I have said respecting and against religion, he explains, I mean strictly to apply to the slave-holding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. This is quite, clear, quite clearly the same method he applied to his own lessons when he first started to learn to read, and now he presents it to his readers so that they can begin to learn how to read their own world. Douglas acquired his own literacy, and now he is calling upon his readers, white and black, to acquire a similar literacy so that they will learn to see their world from outside the circle within which they have been trained and from beyond the gate that has enslaved their minds and souls. And this is what Douglas achieves in his 1845 narrative. The mode of understanding Douglas gains from his experiences enables him to record those experiences. And in that narrative, that mode of understanding becomes the lesson for his readers to learn. Readers should oppose slavery not only because of the horrors Douglas described, they should also oppose slavery because they themselves White readers as well are in danger of being enslaved by the corrupting influence of the system. 
Douglas was not alone in using a slave narrative to convey a warning to white America. Other writers similarly used this genre against, to warn against the corruption of Christianity, the evils of racism, the dangers of white supremacy, the instability of the United States. Even as they seemed to write so as to appeal for sympathy, most of these writers did not want sympathy. They wanted justice. They were not, they were, and they were not appealing to those in authority. They were presenting themselves as authorities, those who knew America, as it were, from the inside out. Consider the example of Reverend Samuel Ringgold Ward, author of Autobiography of a Fugitive Negro, His Anti-Slavery Labors in the United States, Canada, and England, which was published in London in 1855. Ward, who pointedly identifies himself in the narrative as both a British subject and a fugitive Negro, and who identifies Toronto as his home in the title page, was born in 1817 in Maryland's Eastern Shore. His family escaped slavery and settled in New Jersey in 1820 and then in New York City in 1826. In New York, Ward attended a school established for African American children and later became a teacher in Newark, New Jersey until 1839. And at that time, he was ordained by the New York Congregational Association, after, he, after which he served as a pastor to a white congregation in South Butler, New York and later to a white congregation in Cortland, New York. Following Ward's involvement in the rescue of a fugitive slave in 1851, Ward found it necessary to move to Canada, Canada to avoid being captured by the authorities, and he became an agent of the Anti-Slavery Society of Canada, and in that capacity he traveled to England. Clergyman, abolitionist, editor, author, Ward was one of the most prominent figures in and commentators on the anti-slavery movement. And in Autobiography of a Fugitive Negro, Ward draws from the full range of his experiences, connecting himself to the community of anti-slavery workers, white and black, whom he mentions by name, and addressing the broad field of anti-slavery labor and the racial and cultural politics behind those efforts throughout his 412-page narrative. In the end, Ward leaves his readers with a vision of the glories of the British Empire as a moral force in the world. Coming from a distant colony as I do, Ward writes in his concluding paragraph, and knowing how powerful is the Christian church of this great country in molding the religious character of the colonies, knowing too how much the colonies have to do with the evangelicalism of the evangelization, I'm sorry, of the heathen contiguous to them, it is impossible for me to express how deep and thorough was my gratitude to find the religious state of Great Britain what it is in this respect. Indeed, there is no possibility of exaggerating the extent of holy influence which must, of necessity, flow from this all-important fact. The growth of wealth, increase of power, and widening political influence of Britain being considered how thankful ought Britons to be to Britain's God for the present religious condition of this mighty empire. Okay, he's pushing Britain here to make a point. Ward's vision of empire is a vision borrowed from American mythology. But of course, it's important that he's applying it to Great Britain. In fact, many abolitionists took pleasure in asserting that England was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And many argued that all of, our, all of the ideals associated with America including a devotion to Christianity, could actually be found in Great Britain and not in America. Ward makes it clear, too, that this is not a narrative designed to inspire anti-slavery sympathy in any conventional sense. Speaking of his anti-slavery efforts, Ward notes that in pleading the cause of the blacks before the whites, while I tried faithfully to depict the suffering of the enslaved and the injustice done to the nominally free, I never stoop to ask pity for either. Wronged, outraged, scattered, peeled, killed all the day long as they are, I never so compromised my own self-respect, nor ever consented to so deep a degradation of my people as to condescend to ask pity for them at the hands of their oppressors. 
Similarly, Ward's emphasis on oppression in the autobiography is designed not for sympathy, but to insist upon fundamental rights, and in fact to comment on the limitations of white sympathy. Those who have done us injury, Ward notes in a statement that still resonates today, think it a virtue to express sympathy with us, a sort of arm's length, cold-blooded sympathy, while neither of those would on any account consent to do towards us the commonest justice. What the Negro needs is what belongs to him, what has been ruthlessly torn from him, and what is, by consent of a despotic democracy and a Christless religion, withholden from him guiltily, perseveringly, when he shall have that restored, he can acquire pity enough and all the sympathy he needs, cheap wares as they are. But to ask for them instead of his rights was never my calling. As this statement makes clear, Ward's purpose in writing his narrative is to resist a despotic democracy and a Christless religion, to work towards a systemic liberation of the oppressed, and to warn his white readers of the dangers they faced the evils they supported, the corruption that threatened their security, and the instabilities that would ultimately threaten their souls. Those who wrote slave narratives were determined to tell truths that white Americans were largely unprepared to hear, and the narratives they wrote cannot be confined to any neat category of literature or history. What kinds of stories did they tell? Stories you might expect and stories you would not expect from such obscure works as Life and Adventures of Robert the Hermit of Massachusetts, published in 1829, to such famous works as Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery, published in 1901, slave narratives told a range of stories from the local to the national. Some narratives were written in England, such as William and Ellen Crafts, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, or the first English edition of Henry Box Brown's story. Some are associated with other significant historical sites. For example, Elizabeth Keckley's Behind the Scenes or 30 Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House, published in 1868, a book that relates Keckley's experiences as a dressmaker in the White House when Abraham Lincoln was president. Some were published and promoted in regions not generally associated with the history of slavery, upstate New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, in such cities as St. Louis, Milwaukee, and Hartford. Some were published before the Civil War, often though not always, to promote the anti-slavery cause, and others were written and published after the Civil War, sometimes in an effort to make a living, and often to promote racial justice. Some were supported by organizations, and many were written and self-published in isolated regions. Some have been celebrated, and some have been all but forgotten and are still waiting for readers. One might say that all of these narratives were written because the writers had experienced life in the United States from a perspective that is badly needed if the nation is to survive and thrive. And given that these narratives address virtually every aspect of US culture, from economic and legal life to political and theological life, and given that these narratives address intricate details that, and submerged currents in our culture that have done much to shape the world we live in today, these are narratives we still need to read, not just to understand the past, but also to understand the present and to determine what kind of future is available to us. We can't afford to ignore these narratives. We still have much to learn from them, and time seems increasingly short for those lessons. Thank you.